All hail the Seven Night Compass. All hail the Skull. All hail the Skull. Greetings, adventurous travelers and fellow keepers of the lake. Welcome to the breakdown of the GM guide part of the book. So the DM guide in this book consists of, well, mostly like a story, how to do hex crawls, um, how to teach the game, how to run monsters, how to manage walls, a lot of things about pacing and things like that. Yeah, it, it mostly consists of like uh, tips on how to be uh, a good DM, but you might ask, where are the mechanics then? Well, as we said, this is more of a player-facing game, so uh, most of the roles you'll be doing as a player, most of the like allocating of your points you will be doing as a player. As a GM, you will be focusing on the fun. What are the, the things that you will do most as a DM? Well, um, first of all, you will be tracking phases, as you saw in the combat episode. If you didn't watch that, go and watch the combat episode in the player guide, as a bunch of things that you need to know as a DM, like 90% of the things are in the, the player guide. So, as a DM, you will just be screaming, it's phase one, who is up, it's phase two, who is up. And it's important for you as a DM to understand uh, the phases, intuitively understand them. So, okay, some players might think, uh, number one, the phase one, it's the most useful phase, right? Well, no, uh, this is maybe a useful phase if you want to ambush someone or, or do something like that, but think about like phases four and five. What happens in the phase four? If you have a very strong enemy and it's uh, attacking in the phase four, it is very deadly because if you take the shot to the heart and you basically get overpowered, you, you lose all your skills and you lose all your inventory. On the end of the fifth phase, your character will be permanently taken away by the Grim Reaper. So this phase five is where, for example, your healers would act. If someone falls, takes the, the shot to the heart, well, the healer can haste and maybe heal that person. So it's important to understand how choosing a phase for a monster is another way of managing difficulty without having huge stat blocks and like complicated mechanics. And the players, they will gamify this, they will understand the pattern, they will say, oh, this monster has a very screwed up attack on phase 4, so don't don't come near it on the phase 4. You, as a DM, should go and try like to run a couple of battles on your own, like against yourself solo, just to see how it flows and get the idea of which phase is uh, good for what. Of course, players, they are known for forgetting when to roll their things, so you will be calling the defense rolls, damage rolls, and also you will be uh, the one who will assign attrition. Don't let them forget that they are losing something if they are hit by the enemy. Of course, when, where there is being hit by the enemy, there is also rest. You will be managing all the rests. Right, as a DM, that's not everything you will do. You will also be attacking everyone, so... Uh, when I say attacking everyone, you want to be fierce, you want to be like um, pushing your players to the limits. That's what makes it fun. The the danger in this game, the setting and, and the feeling of like needing to think outside of the box to solve the problem of survival, that's where, where this shines a lot. And that's why don't spare your players and embrace emergent storytelling. You'll be also calling for d20 rolls and I've mentioned this in the first video where uh, whenever you have a situation like for example two people are grappling and I know you would say like for Pathfinder or D&D fans well you would roll like uh, strength rolls not quite here you can just say it's kind of a, a situation of luck if the person you grappled is stronger than you so just rolling two d20s and comparing them and taking the lower one why I'm bringing this up is because you as a D you need to know when to use this. Think about like uh, removing the, the stats from your mental arsenal of like mechanics when you're thinking about this game and think about when you're invoking pure luck and when that can be simulated with just two d20s. Also you will be mixing up enemies a lot like making the battlefield dynamic. For example, here you have like three minions which will die in like one hit. You have three ranged enemies and two heavy. What does it mean to be heavy? Well, basically you just like buff them up real hard, like give them a big attack value or consider even adding additional attrition for this enemy, which will like really pump up the difficulty. And yeah, we're talking about difficulty. So whenever we are making rolls, you know how in D&D you can say like DC of 
10 is something that anyone can do. DC of 15 is like more difficult. So you can either modify the DCs or you can modify the player roles. Well, here, if you think something is difficult, just de decrease the value that they have to meet by five. Of course, remind your players that they can remove this penalty with RP or like creative thinking, creative solutions. So for example, you want to climb somewhere, you have a climb skill of like six. Well, if it's a very steep climb and you, you don't have like anything to latch on to, you would be using the minus five rule. Listen to your players, listen how they are uh, portraying their attacks and make some of them deadly, which means basically they get an additional uh, die to throw, which is amazing. It's a, it feels amazing when you as a player do something like jump from a roof with like daggers pointed towards your target at the ground and land on them, something like that. It, it really makes the player feel powerful when they do that and you as a DM reward them with making that attack deadly. Basically, you as a DM are bringing up the players. Uh, the, you're making them feel powerful. You're invoking fear into them. You are the creative force, the wind into their backs that will make them feel amazing during play. And on this note, I think I have it here. Oh, 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 oh. And this is also the, the book from the same author as Crown and Skull. But what I want to show you is the oath of the dungeon master. I will let the torrent flow, I will remember everything. I will build a world from their actions. I will be the architect, I will be the poet. I will be energetic, I will lift them up and vanish. I will be a beacon of camaraderie, I will be the terror to behold. An amazing thing. Consider reading the breakdown of this oath as it basically covers all this. The next thing you as a DM will certainly need to do is think about suspense. So think about timer dies. You will see that the concept of timer dies shows a lot in anything that Runehammer makes, but I will not go into like using the triple T's and, and all that here. Please go and watch some of his videos. I will link some in the description and also grab the index card RPG, one of the best and simplest GM guides out there. And it covers uh, the mechanic of suspense. As a DM, you will be setting up encounters. And this book also contains uh, setting up uh, sessions and how the flow will go. I think it's more of a general TTRPG tips. So I wouldn't go into that here. I just thought that encounter setup has a couple of interesting things. <laughs> Encounters are focused on narrative here, mostly on narrative, and they are designed to be super fast. So these are a couple of like um, things to keep in mind, not mechanical wise, but like tip wise. These are a couple of things to keep in mind when designing the encounter. The first thing, so let's, let's imagine you have like a strange monster with one big eyeball and it, it, this is you and you have the cave. And one of the concepts that Hankerun is talking about in the book is called the blast. So it blasts the cave you fall down into the grotto and now you you have a different type of terrain your environment has changed encounter has shifted maybe the the being that you were fighting the monster you were fighting exploded and died so you fell into the cave and now a big crab is after you so consider adding the blast the blast is the concept where you change the layout of the environment and the dynamics of the encounter mid encounter and it's pretty useful another thing that Yankarin uh, mentions here is yeah use uh, like um, poorly acted NPCs for example for comedic relief someone that is completely not capable of fighting for example or has only one technique and just fails in this type of encounter, it will be a comedic relief and it will also be an NPC that is constantly in trouble and players kind of like him and kind of hate him, but they have to help him every time. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept to think about. Also, whenever you have like um, introduction of your NPCs or like enemies, f feel free to use like the anime type of descriptions and like, make the enemy look badass or make the players look badass. Like try to uh, bring everyone up in your descriptions. Also, yeah, the goo, stay out of the goo. This is a concept where you have the goo that you don't want to, to touch. And it basically represents the situations where your environment is dangerous. You have a bunch of interactive parts of the encounter, the environment. For example, you don't stand in the goo, but then each 
1d6 rounds, the goo uh, retracts and then you have 1d6 rounds until it comes back. I've actually run uh, a mechanic like that and it was pretty fun. The players were constantly on the edge trying to like predict when the goo will come back so that they can move. Another thing that you should have in your DM arsenal is thinking about line of sight. I think line of sight is something that we as dungeon masters sometimes either overuse or underuse and it's a very powerful thing. Whenever you design an encounter and whenever you're running the encounter, like think about the line of sight. Even if you're playing gridless, even if you're playing theater of the mind, and I say this because when you play with a grid, you're probably using the built-in line of sight rules. But I play gridless, for example, and for me, sometimes I forget that line of sight is very important. With line of sight, you can create some interesting monster algorithms, for example. I will link to a video from the author talking about how line of sight will help you develop different behaviors for certain monsters. And that algorithmic type of behavior of the monsters was streamlined and added in this book, as you will see. The next concept is to not be afraid to add a lot of monsters. Swarm! It's a big one, team! They're all defeated, but they don't have to be. So if your players are getting cocky, you can always throw a bunch of enemies like this at them and they should at one point consider running away. You demonstrate that the power of the world is sometimes bigger than the players. Let them feel it. Don't let them be cocky and think that there will be no swarm. It happens to me all the time when I play Deep Rock Galactic. I am quite a fan of Deep Rock Galactic. These are the minis from their board game on Kickstarter. If you're interested in that, I will post a link uh, of it as well. Right, so now that we're talking about enemies, well, how do you run enemies? I think that one of the biggest things that hurdles me when I'm playing like D&D or Pathfinder is the huge stat blocks and the burden on me to like think about what each of the 10 enemies will, will do to the players. And of course, here, you have phases so sometimes you will have multiple enemies act on multiple different phases for multiple numbers of actions how does that work how is that streamlined really well tactics each enemy has a tactic up to three tactics per phase so it's important to know that they're per phase because an enemy that acts on two phases and has three actions per phase well that's a bloody powerful enemy don't you think so uh the tactics basically work as such you roll a d6. If you roll a 1, the enemy mostly does something that is either like displacing itself or someone, moving to a different place, healing, doing things like that. So it's more like of a passive type of um, action. If you roll 2 to 5, the enemy will probably attack someone. Most likely the person that is closest. You can also roll to see who is being attacked and if you roll six as it did here well that's uh, most likely an area of effect attack and these are just like general descriptions i will put the the stat block examples somewhere around here so you can see how it looks but these are the guidelines you would use if you want to create your own enemy for example there is a bunch of enemies in the beast theory as well inside this book so let's get this out of the way the enemies they are not stupid so they will always engage uh, in combat if they, they won't like you won't be rolling tactics if your enemies are like far away you will engage the players first even if you roll a tactic that is for example stupid you're attacking but you have no one to attack you're the dm just say that the monsters are engaging and that's it that's all you need to know like the combat uh, it functions as you would imagine the enemies have in their stat blocks the amount of attrition they deal the players roll their defenses and if they fail their defenses you apply that attrition so yeah that's that's pretty much it and you have these small 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 stat blocks which are amazing so another concept from the book that i would just like to mention is that it kind of revolutionizes how you play dungeons with their uh, mapless dungeon type of crawl and it's all the hype but i won't be talking about that because paladin pros has a great video about it and i will link it in the description as well and yeah the, the, the last question is progression well you would mostly manage progression through points and be very picky when and how you give points to the players 
Uh, there is like some guidelines in the book, but not really. Um, mostly like uh, give three to four points per session per player, I would say. You can, if you want to make it slower progression, you can make it even less than that. But if they are doing some great deeds, you would give more than that. And of course, one thing that I haven't uh, mentioned in the player's guide is why this book is called Crown and Skull. It's not because this skull has a crown, but it's because there are two paths uh, on which you can embark it happens when you collect uh, enough points so i think it's around 50 points uh, that you collected in game not at character creation and then you choose one of the progression paths the way of the crown or the way of the skull and in terms of lore you would see that a lot of people like inside the world have these rings which they wear with the crown or a skull and it's not really alignment based uh, there is no alignment in this game but it's not like alignment uh, like the crown people are good the skull people are bad but the crown would still emphasize like some form of order um, law and the skull would be more like um, the lone wolf type of characters or the, the the rogues this is like the most surface level talk about this you would see hankering say that these are more like uh, life philosophies than alignments and and it's more tied to the lore and i'm really like trying to not talk about lore here i'm not skipping it because it's bad it's actually very good but i'm skipping it just not to um spoil the whole book for you Anyways, uh, this was a long one and I hope it was useful. It's more like uh, a bunch of tips than mechanics, I know, but that's how it was written in the book. I'm just trying to break it down, give you like highlights. But if you watch this and you watch the, the player guides, you're basically ready to, to start running the game. Uh, there is a Stormpoint Asylum dungeon here that is a mapless dungeon. I've run it. I'm making a video that is talking about how that went. So some form of like session recap type of thing. And yeah, um, if you you liked this video series and you think this was useful please subscribe to this channel because my, my dream is to have more than like a, a hundred subscribers and I'm so so close there will be a bunch of creative content on this channel not only DD crown and skull uh, TTRPG stuff but also like anything that is concerning art and creative thinking it just uh, happens that as of now I am totally addicted to RPGs so I'm talking about that I guess and as always keep on going keep Keep on running, keep on being creative, play more D&D, &D, and I will see you in the next one. Farewell, keepers.